Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another COVID-19 update with the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. I'm Donna Prosser, and I am the Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement. And we're very excited to be joined today by Dr. Edward Kelly and Dr. Anagret Hanawa. Um, I would love, uh, Dr. Edward Kelly is representing the World Health Organization, and Dr. Anagret Hanawa is an Associate Professor at the Center for the Advancement of Healthcare Quality and Patient Safety. So welcome panelists, can you hear me? Yes, are you there? Oh, hi Ed, how are you today? Thank you so much for joining. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your background today? Sure, I'll start. Uh, I'm Ed Kelly, I'm Director for Integrated Health Services, uh, and that's my peacetime job. And now during the uh, outbreak, I am one of the um, uh, team leads or pillar leads as they're called uh, within WHO's uh, response team for the uh, COVID outbreak. Wonderful, thank you, Ed. And Anna Gret, would you introduce yourself for the team, for the, the network, please? Yes, sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Anna Gret Hanawa. I'm a professor at the University of Lugano, where I direct the Center for Patient Safety and Quality Care at the Faculty of Communication Sciences. Well, thank you. Welcome, both of you today. We're so excited to have you here. So as everybody knows, we are now into week five of our COVID-19 pandemic, and this has devastated the global economy. We don't have to tell anybody that. You can see that all over the news. And, and unemployment is at all-time highs, and that has created a significant amount of depression and anxiety and despair across the world. So we thought it was important to address this topic today to talk about what, what we can do to mitigate some of this. So before we get started, though, um, Ed, could you tell us just a little bit about what is happening across the world? What is the World Health Organization seeing happening right now? Yep, thanks uh, so much, Donna, for that. And again, for the invitation to come and um, be with you. Uh, it's uh, one of these um, opportunities uh, during the week to reconnect with patient safety uh, colleagues, um, and it's always good to see the names uh, that are there. And at some level, we're dealing with sort of the world's biggest uh, patient safety crisis ever, I suppose, but um, uh, it's great. Also, uh, we've worked with Integrate, uh over the years um, in looking at uh, some of the, uh, a whole bunch of different uh, areas that, that her team has examined um, not the least of which is the sort of mental health impacts of patient safety events, both on providers and patients. And uh, so this issue on mental health, um, staying healthy during the outbreak and others has been a big theme for, for WHO and for the Director General, particularly this uh, past week. It's a, it's a health crisis, a health systems crisis, but much more an all of society crisis. So I think it's a great opportunity to, to do that. Um, so maybe, uh, shall I just, um, Donna, launch in and, and uh, go through a, a, a little bit of background and then, um, and then it could be a nice framing for Anagret to, to take it from there. That would be wonderful. Yes, thank you. And just let me know when you would like for me to advance your slides. Sure. Well, uh, I have some slides that um, are, I'll spend not so much time explaining because I think it's better for people to use as a reference point. Um, uh, sometimes these numbers, they get sort of a little bit uh, mind numbing. We look at them every day. Um, and I think, you know, in this type of framing where everything sometimes seems like it's just going from bad to worse, um, it's, I think, very important to see, um, uh, you know, to see actually what the data says and, what, and to really look at, uh, you know, where the problems are, where the solutions are having an impact. And um, you can see uh, impact being had in many parts of the world. Um, but just to summarize, you know, this slide gives you a, a overall impact of a picture of the, of the number of cases and number of deaths. But globally, globally, we are, um, there's been a, a sort of, a, if you look across the different regions, um, there's been uh, an increase in um, the total number of cases in most uh, regions. Uh, the Western Pacific, small increase. That's mostly due, due to Japan, um, a 6% increase in, in the Southeast Asia region. These are like by WHO region of the world in the Southeast Asia region, 86% um, um, increase, uh, particularly in Bangladesh and India, 
in, in Euro, there's been a 40% increase, um, and this is in the past uh, week. Um, and maybe we can just, yeah, thank you for putting up the, the map. Um, and uh, the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, which is the Middle East um, uh, region, there's North Africa, there's been a 34% increase in Pajo, um, an 84% increase, and that's uh, mostly a uh, big increase in, in the US, as people know, but also Br Brazil and Peru and an Afro 57% increase. So increases in cases in all areas. But if you look at the percentage of cases that have happened in the last sort of 24 hours and track that over time, it's just a, an, I, uh, you know, things are going up, but as an idea of are they still going up um, as quickly, the percent that have happened in the last 24 hours has steadily been going down. Um, and the percentage of deaths in the last 24 hours is, is going down. So this means that at least in terms of the the slope of the curve globally, globally, it's slowing. Now that's not the case in every uh, sort of country or in every uh, uh, municipality, but I pulled out just a few additional numbers, maybe next slide. Um, to This gives you the picture overall across the world and you can see a big dip um, in the number uh, of deaths with, um, uh, this week. Uh, that was due in, in Italy um, and Germany and Spain started to dip, but it's a bit, quite a bit of a climb in the U.S. that's uh, then countered that a little bit later. Um, and you can see um, when we, uh, WHO is in the midst of doing a new strategy um, for the, that I'll mention later, uh, our first strategy was done for that orange period in the first part of the, uh, when we thought we might have a few countries with 100 plus cases. Um, so it's obviously time for, to update that strategy as we head forward, as you can see the the growth globally. Next slide, please. Um, this gives you sort of by region. Um, and again, it's the number of cases and then the black line represents the number of deaths. Uh, the number of deaths jumps around a lot, but it's a, you know, it's a very different shape in a bunch of places. Um, and just to flag for you, the scales on these are quite different, but it's just really to examine the, the curve that's there. Whereas, um, you know, Europe, has started to slow in terms of cases. They're still jumping around in terms of and so going down in terms of deaths. Other uh, regions have have gone up, but the death rate's been relatively slow. Um, uh, and then in the U.S., uh, climbing cases and climbing deaths. But I'd point out that the U.S. has among the lower case fatality rates for for COVID, and that's um, one of the uh, uh, I think one of the hardening things, at least for for the the U.S. Um, and also a reflection of a, a number of uh, a number of factors, uh, but um, the, we have more detailed information that's coming in terms of um, the types of uh, uh, in terms of the types of age and uh, gender breakdowns and other information. Um, next slide, please. This gives just a, a little bit of hope for countries that are a bit in advance of the U.S. You can see things coming down in Spain and Italy. Um, France, uh, the number of cases a uh, little bit lower, but deaths had, had jumped a um, big uh, set of deaths this week. UK, unfortunately, has been going up. Turkey, and if you look at Ireland and Sweden, had big jumps this week. So it really depends on the, on the country. Um, and, uh, and you can also, um, but in general, there's been positive feeling that uh, overall across the, the world that these measures, particularly the, the physical distancing measures, are having uh, an impact and having a, a big impact. And it's finally being uh, realized this week. Next slide, please. This um, I only put in there because uh, I go back and forth between France and Switzerland. So uh, anyway, um, uh, my daughters wanna know when it is that they can see their friends again. So anyway, not, not probably anytime immediately soon, but at least Switzerland is also having numbers go down. Next slide, please. Uh, this just to, to zoom in just for a second on on the Pan American region, um, which has the U.S. Um, uh, and mo big majority of those cases are are, are in the U.S. Uh, at the at the moment. But that's the the graph for uh, for Pajo. Next slide. And this gives a picture for the different co different countries with that are having some jumps in terms of Canada, uh, Brazil in particular. Um, and Ecuador has had big jumps in deaths, and um, some some of these things are not quite explainable. You can see also um, the general picture that, uh, and I've talked to a number of countries, even a number of states in the U.S., where unfortunately, you know, we're just at the point where, in terms of test availability, tracking this only by the number of cases uh, globally will just not be possible. It doesn't. Um, 
I don't want to say that nobody trusts the, the, the case figure numbers, but it's quite clear that we're only testing a small number of, of um, the people who are out there who, who actually had the disease. And availability of testing, obviously, in Ecuador, you can see the numbers jump all over the place. So it's, uh, it, those, those numbers are as much related to testing strategy, uh, quote unquote, as they are to anything else. Many countries and many decision makers I know are using hospitalization rates and, and death rates as two of their key indicators. Next slide. So I'll, pa I'll uh, um, pause there uh, uh, and just to mention that um, WHO is doing a lot of work on uh, sort of not just what's happening with COVID, but also tracking the, this, you know, what is the impact on other uh, key services that are out there. And I think this is, um, leads very nicely into Annegret's uh, discussion. And, you know, it's quite clear that at one level we, you know, for WHO, for instance, um, it's really not the time for all of the different programs, the malaria program or the, the, the cancer program or the diabetes program or um, the HIV program to get out there and say, look, um, we need to focus on, on my uh, disease area because um, you know, uh, this COVID outbreak is having such a, a big impact on people's access to those services. Uh, that is true, but for WHO as an organization, we need to be able to to focus on solving this problem and then to be able to get back to it. So we can't uh, we can't take our eye off the ball in terms of the in terms of the outbreak. But it, it's it's really quite true, and you hear stories all over the world, and the data starting to show that it's having a big impact on people's access um, ability to access services, and then even their willingness to go and and get services. I think this will um, give us a, a big head start in terms of new ways of delivering care, particularly for some of the chronic conditions, mental health being one of them, but, but there are also um, important uh, um, both health and, and health access uh, questions that maybe be a good uh, handover to uh, Anna Gretz. So maybe back to you, Donna. Well, thank you so much, Ed. That was an excellent summary. And, and it, is, it is quite heartening to see that everybody's efforts at at physical distancing is actually helping. So thank you very much. Anagret, I know that you have an amazing story that you can share with us that, that is very similar to what many people today are feeling. So would you like to share your story? Yes, Donna, thank you. And thanks, Ed, for the, for the really um, uh, the nice update to hear where we're at today. So uh, I've been talking to all of you these past 10 years as a scientist as a person who's been studying the art of safe communication in healthcare and how to improve patient safety. And today I'm here as a patient, um, but I think with hope and not with drama. So I'm trying to uh, just kind of see some parallels of what I experienced these past 14 months and doing a field study as going as a scientist into healthcare unexpectedly as a stroke patient um, exactly a year before uh, we really felt this COVID um, outbreak uh, in our skin, so to say. So um, Donna and I talked about this and she invited me to join in today because maybe there are some parallels of what I experienced that can help people not go into despair, but seeing hope at the end of the horizon as to where we're going after this. Um, there's, you know, mind numbing issues right now. I like that word, Ed, that you just mentioned before. It's mind numbing to hear every day in the news. You know, here in, in Germany, it's even, you know, we don't even get to see any other TV anymore than the mind numbing facts of what's happening. And it's scary. It's push, pushing us into fear, into anxiety, and some of us into depression. We don't know how to pay rent. We don't know how to, you know, get through this. So what happened last year is you know, it was really, funnily, I just noticed that this morning, a year before it hit Germany, and I was here with my parents, and um, I was sitting on a Sunday morning playing chess with my boy, my eight-year-old then, and uh, was trying to cuddle, cuddle him because he was winning the game, and I didn't, <laughs> and he's just a cuddly guy, so I went forward, and I wanted to cuddle him, and then I, I went down on the floor, and I was lying there, and um, that's where my travel as a patient started. So I had, I had a stroke and um, went into healthcare. I, within a minute, lost everything I had. Um, I lost my two sons for a long time. I was into multiple healthcare clinics and stroke units and all that. I was locked down, so I know what lockdown feels like, but not being isolated at home, but being isolated in various stroke units and far away from the home, uh, all by myself. 
um, life being reduced to a 30 meter hallway where you're locked on cords and cables and you can't even get out to get a coffee. So as of, you know, things are taken to you, looking in that face of mother nature telling us you can't have that anymore, where we're thinking we have our human rights and yet we notice they're just human rights that we made up for ourselves. They're not really holding up anymore when it comes down to mother nature telling us differently. So I've just gone through that really. It, it, it went through at least seven to eight months where, where I wish that, you know, sometimes that, that stroke would have let me go and I wouldn't have to live through the pains and despair that, that you're know, realizing lots of physical pain, lots of sacrifices and you wonder why. And um, so I walked through that and it took me six to seven months to see why. And um, what's happening now with COVID, interestingly, is reminding me a lot on what I already went through last year. Lots of similarities with the lockdown, with the isolation, with the despair, with phases of depression. But then I'm on the other end now. So I was thinking, you know, by what I went through, maybe I can give you hope. And um, uh, life goes on. And a lot of what we, I think what COVID is showing us is a, is a lot of what we've seen as what our life is actually isn't really our human nature anymore and um, these kind of incidents bring us back to our core roots of who we are as humans and uh, bring us together again and so to to help everyone see that and also to bring everyone aboard I um, did a non-academic website <laughs> shared that with Donna so she's going to show that later and um, where I think um, there are some of the needs that that we can we can address in coming together as people again um, sharing our stories also for patient safety you know we've talked about um, what's really patient safety patient safety means that we're bringing people together again right we're bringing patients with families together with healthcare professionals so they're they're coming together and providing good care that's safe and good for everyone so um, I'm optimistic about what's happening it's it's terrifying I'm not saying it's not terrifying but I think what's happening is giving us an opportunity to change things so that when the next pandemic hits and the next natural catastrophes that could be coming hit us, we're going to have um, a system and structures around us that will get us through this better than we're doing it now. So hopefully we can learn from this and take it as a chance to make things a bit better. Wow. So, wow. Uh, yeah. Sure. So I think we can go on to the Next slide, Donna. And I only have three slides for you guys, so I'm going to take a short so there's um, questions and answers sessions. But so I've, I'm just addressing um, three, I would say, mental health issues. I'm not a mental health professional, just to make that clear. I'm really now today not talking to you as a scientist as much as I'm talking to you as a, as a patient scientist who's had experience in this field and living through this. But I do know, you know, from, as a sociologist, as our, what our human needs are, our basic human needs that all of us share. And one of them is the need for belonging. And I think that's a, that's a really, really important need in a time where our fears are coming up higher than ever before. Um, so our human belonging is a need that we have and here we find ourselves in a context of isolation. Isolation that's being enforced in some countries, even by military, <laughs> and that we, we must not go out and see our loved ones. And um, we find ourselves in an interesting context where at least here we see on the news you know, there's people in isolation and ice and, and, and rehab, the rehab clinic. I was in for 10 weeks last year. People can't go out anymore. There's 50 cases in that clinic now. Um, and yet there's families that are together. And in those families, domestic violence and things like this are skyrocketing. So I find that really interesting. And I think that's pointing us at a really important issue that maybe we haven't looked at before enough. And uh, to see, yes, there is financial issues going on. But what are the real issues that humankind is dealing with here? It's interpersonal issues. Um, but so in that context, so uh, we have a need for belonging, yet we're isolated. And um, one of the things I did on this website for everyone is to, and I like the word you, you said, Ed, and also Donna, it's physical distancing. It's not social distancing. Here we're, in Europe, we're still using that word social distancing way too much, I think. Um, yes, we need to stay physically distant, but it doesn't, been, it doesn't mean that we need to distance ourselves socially. So I put up on, you can click, click on that link if you'd like, on a, um, a storytelling um, website, or it's part of that website, it's a um, storytelling platform where I invite people from all over the world to send in their stories. Um, 
and I've had, you know, I have four submissions up here and I invite everyone to share their own as well. And if you'd like to click on the one on fear, isolation, panic and sickness, Donut, the, yeah, that one, um, it shows you, yes, um, people just writing up these beautiful things. Some of this, this went, I think went viral, this story, and I, I put it up on this website to share because I think it's so beautiful. It's people talk, talking about, yes, there's fear, yes, there's isolation, there's panic buying, there's sickness, there's even death. But in Wuhan, they say there's so many years of, there's been so many years of noise and they can hear the birds again and they see the blue skies again. And in the CC, people are opening their windows to share, you know, their family life with people who are alone. So I think that, you know, with this dark tunnel of despair that, that COVID has driven us into, all of a sudden we see um, light appearing between us that we haven't seen like this before. And it's a tender light. And I think that it allows us to find um, a different interpersonal togetherness again that's giving us a chance to become healthier. And yeah, I, I think that's one of the one of the things that, that I invite you to participate in and overcoming that loneliness at home with being able to join in on the web. And we have that resource now. That's one of the benefits of digital uh, communication is you don't have to be lo lonely. And storytelling is giving us a chance to really feel into that um, new area between us that's, that's establishing itself here all of a sudden. So that's the, the one part, the storytelling about loneliness. And then the next slide, please. We have um, lots of stress and anxiety. Um, where does uh, that stress and anxiety come from? Well, it's, it's uh, uncertainty, right? Also, we get to that in a minute, but we need, uh, that's very clear, I think now, um, it's a marathon coming at us. And Albert has used that word in a publication that he just sent out last week to all of us. And there's a marathon coming up and we're gonna need a lot of psychological and mental stamina um, to get through this and also clear heads to get through this. And this picture, Donna asked me to share it. Um, I've been like all of you probably homeschooling my kids at home well, <laughs> and caring for my parents as well. And uh, so we had this fingerprints um, arts class I was having to do with them. And we came up with this picture together and showing what is mindful and what is mindful. And I think this nicely reflects also the mind numbing nature we are in when we're in despair. And that's the left picture. There is, you know, we, we know this, what's in front of us, but there's so much cluttering in our heads. And I think um, with stress and anxiety, we've seen that with the mindfulness-based stress reduction by John Kabat-Zinn. There's been lots of research on that practice. We, we can clear that out to, to calm down and keep a clear head and heal again. And I think this is a very important um, resource that all of us can, can benefit off. Um, so also on this website, if you'd like to click on that, Donna, for a second, I am actually spending day and night now to provide you all this. Um, uh, yeah, is that, a, is, that, is that a link? I'm sorry, I'm having a little trouble yeah. with my mouse for some reason. I apologize. Okay, it's, it's okay. So on that website under resources, you'll see I'm putting up um, in two languages for now um, an MBSR program, sort of a crash course um, for all of you to use for free. Um, so I'm kind of, you know, I've taken that course also in part of my recovery after the stroke and with my own PTSD um, I, I ran into. And it helps you all to just join in. It's a day by day, small 15 to 20 minutes. Um, reading as you can see it here. So there's an introduction and then I put it down into small chunks of daily information with exercises that you can do. Um, I recorded some meditations for you to, to go and feel our body again because the more we were able to come back into that here and now and cleanse our head from that clutter that you saw in that other picture, uh, the fingerprinting picture, um, the, the healthier we can be. And this is for health professionals. I put it up there for health professionals because they don't have much time right now to <laughs> add learning, but it's for everyone to use. So if you don't want to do the full-blown eight-week course that you can do online with all kinds of providers, um, this is a shorter version that that's, um, kind of helps you equip yourself with, with resources that can help us you know, last through this marathon and particularly healthcare staff at the front line of care. So I invite you to um, look at that as well, if you'd like. Um, and then we get to the last one, uh, Donna, on the, on the slide. Um, that is about the uncertainty. So that was stress and anxiety. Can and yes, so this goes back to my patient safety background, right? <laughs> and uh, um, I believe that, you know, well, I'm hearing stories from a lot of frontline clinicians, of course, and um, about the despair that they also feel at the frontline of care. 
And what I'm seeing is just, there's a, a lot of COVID, and it's bringing us a lot of uncertainty, right? And uncertainty brings us fear because, you know, if we're not prepared. So how can we better prepare ourselves so that our fear and uncertainty decreases? I think that's the key question. And I think more than ever, um, we need to come together as clinicians at the front line across the globe, sharing with each other treatment successes and failures. There's no reason to reinvent the wheel if others have done those trial and errors and learned from them. So also on that website, I, I put up a knowledge repository where clinicians can enter their stories. And um, if you'd like to show that for a second. Um, so please feel free, there's, there's been a couple of submissions. Please feel free to um, um, send your work up there. You can just, um, there's a submission link on that website as well. And from all over the world, please share your stories, what has worked, what hasn't worked. Um, you can share your, your um, ideas about better self-protection against the virus, helping yourself um, not get infected, or about treatment of patients, whatever you think other clinicians over the, this planet can benefit from. I think this is a phenomenal way of us to start a new way of coming together also at the front line of care. And I think it's beautiful how we're already seeing that despite the despair, you know, nurses and physicians are suddenly you know, losing their coats and they're all the same and they're coming together so closely and facing this challenge together. And the border lines between the countries are falling and everyone is just in the same spot, same time, in the same location, so to say, about how to deal with, you know, this virus. And I think this is giving us a great chance um, to come together. It's really a patient safety goal we've been trying to attain for a long time. So I'm very actually optimistic about what opportunity we're getting through, through this experience, what we can hopefully carry on beyond and COVID once it's um, passed us again. So that has been my three. Um, yes, I think we have one more concluding slide, Donna. Is that? Yes, about, yes. So, so we've been talking about safe communication. We've been talking about um, guidelines of practice, safe practice, what you can do. And, you know, there's more and more guidelines coming out and crisis communication. And there's as many opinions as people almost out there now. And again, what I feel troubling about that, we're already mind numb. And there's so much information and facts coming at us and guidelines are not going to work well right now in addition to what else we have to deal with. And you know, I get, I get um, emails now about 70, 80 a day, uh, clinicians asking also, you know, what else can I do? What else can I take in? I don't even know if we're prepared. There's fear, there's despair, there's anxiety, there's uncertainty. And on top of that, guidelines are not going to penetrate. So as my, as my reflection on the guidelines I have over years of research put out as mm -hmm. Sasha Safe Communication, this is what we need to practice to bring people together. You know, really what this is showing us is that safe communication just means us coming together as humans again. And not only at the front line of care, it also applies to pol politics, it applies to governing, it applies to um, patients and neighbors at home, you know, going out to run errands for people that are not allowed to leave the home right now. It's everyone is coming together through what COVID-19 is giving us as a gift, so to say. And I'd really like us to not fall into despair. There is a light on the other side and we will get there. And when we're there, you may be surprised that you may not want to return back to where we came from. So that's my spirit I'd like to give you as a thought for food for thought, so to say. Thank you, Donna. That is wonderful, Anna Grant. What a, you have such a powerful story and what amazing resources you've provided for the world. Thank you very much. Uh, we do have a question for you from the audience. Um, and for, for the rest of the audience, we, are, we have plenty of time for question and answer today. So please enter any questions into the chat box or into the Q&A section for us, okay? Um, Anna Gret, uh, the question was for you, can you comment on how the isolation after your stroke impacted your family? And, and how did you help your family to recover from worrying about you during that time? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> so um, I, I'm a single mom with two children and they were eight and 10 at the time of my stroke. Um, and I was in my first stroke unit here for four days, and then I returned home for uh, about an hour, and then the next stroke came. And within 20 minutes, the ambulance was in front of my door to bring me two and a half hours away from my home to the next stroke unit at a big university hospital, the Cathedral of Stroke Medicine in, in Germany. And um, so 
my kids, um, I don't know how they, I should have them here on this call. <laughs> They've been so amazingly inspiring and strong through this. Um, of course, they feared of losing their mom, but they don't have any trauma from any of this. And, and um, my son, and I'll never forget this, we talked on the phone on a weekend when I was there and weekends were really the worst because you just locked in and then I was up there far away. I didn't have visitors come in. Everybody else got visitors come in. And um, so we talked on the phone and, and my, I talked to my, my 10 year old and he said, mom, the, the happiness and anticipation is the greatest happiness there is. So the longer you're gone, the greater my happiness to see you again. So I didn't have to help them cope. And uh, it was just, I don't know, it was probably the most mindful experience I ever had. And trust me, I was the most prepared, <laughs> pre-booked, to-do listed person in the world. <laughs> I was always, I planned my life out when I was 15. Um, so the stroke just didn't work for me at all. But it just put me into a position that we're living now with COVID, which is we can't plan for tomorrow. It's just right now how it is. And I've just, I don't know what will happen tomorrow anymore. I have, I have, I, I mean, at November at the latest, I stopped trying because our life happens now and that's the reality of it. And what, what we do when we think about the future and oh, gosh, how am I going to pay my rent at the end of the month? I mean, Donna, I told you they, they cut my, my sick leave insurance pay the day before Christmas and I, and then the offices were closed for two weeks and from, you know, I would just said, I know how that feels. You know, we had bread and butter for Christmas Eve, my sons and I, we just didn't know. I didn't know how to make it for the next two weeks financially. And we made it. And, you know, the school director came by and brought me a filet of fish and, you know, for, somehow we got through and, and we received and we gave back and, even now, I just took a bike ride with my boys this morning. It's evening here. And um, everywhere you go by, there's boxes outside of people's houses where things they're giving away. All of a sudden, they have time to cleanse out their houses and they give things away. Um, and we give things back. So I think we need to just have faith that, you know, there, there are, you know, societies on this planet that don't have money, you know, and, and they live. And um, if we can't pay, we will continue to live. It, it'll be different. It'll be, I don't want to say better words, it'll be different, but we will survive and we will come together and survive. So, but to get back to the question, sorry. Um, yeah, I didn't have to help them cope and um, somehow it just all came into place and it worked out and I don't know how. I've, I've seen a lot of um, other patients in that setting and it happened the same way for them. So Wonderful. that's all I can say. <laughs> And did you learn about mindfulness while you were a stroke patient in the hospital, or did you learn about that after you got home? I learned it in 10 weeks rehab. So I was in fall, I went to do 10 week rehab treatment, and there was a wonderful, it's in a, um, there was a psychosomatic uh, department in there as well. And um, so I, I went into that physical um, program where you, you, you learn to build strength again in order to gain confidence in your body again and so forth. And they had this mindfulness program there and um, it was mindfulness yoga. So slowly coordinating your movements again and so forth. And that's where I started. And then when I went out of that rehab setting, I, I asked for resources. So I got this wonderful book. Um, it's an eight week workshop, the MBSR workshop. And I, I continued that. And then I did another one. So I kind of found a lot of, um, and eventually your body just learns to do it. It's, it's, it's really interesting because we're going back to where we were. Um, so we already have it in us, I think. It's just a memory of, a reminder of how we used to live when we were young. <laughs> and we go back and all of a sudden it's like, wow, you know, this is actually a really comforting life because whenever I get distressed now, I just go back to my feet touching the ground and I feel myself here. Oh, I'm right here in this moment. Why, am I, why is my brain out there? It's, it's right here and here, everything's fine. I'm sitting here, I'm safe, you know, there's no, no storm outside, like threatening my life. I'm sitting here with you guys and I'm, I'm fine right now. So this is all that matters. Very well. Very well Ed. Um, Ed, I wonder if you can um, answer for us. We had a question from the audience that wanted to know, are there any new research programs out there that you're aware of that could support the front line during and after this outbreak? 
Yeah, good question. I mean, I guess the front line uh, is, um, uh, as Andy Grip was just making clear, touches on a lot of people, people who respond to uh, emergencies, both in this case, you know, uh, people living at home who may not have gotten to the hospital early enough for COVID, but then we're also having kind of crisis situations that they weren't able to seek care for in a timely way or even just an emergency situation like a stroke. So that's the ambulance drivers and others. Um, there, we, um, there is a, a bunch of research uh, going on in, uh, WHO has um, a whole big, big research and development uh, R&D platform working with um, the Wellcome Trust and uh, a bunch of other US government, a bunch of other organizations that uh, are looking at both the, uh, the whole, whole bit of work on vaccine work. There's over 52 vaccines in different stages of trials around the world, but, um, and it's moving faster than any other vaccine trial has, has ever moved. Um, but there's also a lot of work on therapeutics, um, and there's also work on uh, sort of different aspects, reviewing uh, use of different personal protective equipment, um, factors in healthcare uh, worker protection. And we actually, this coming week, there'll be a lot of focus, I think. Uh, actually, I thought it was gonna be last week, but the whole world seemed to focus on this issue of masks uh, for all of us to wear or not wear, um, which by the way, anyway, I'm happy to answer questions on that offline. That's a uh, um, WHO has a clear stance on that. But then um, the, uh, but there is, we're doing some more deep dives on healthcare worker protection. We have a whole bit of work um, that touches on mental health and uh, for healthcare workers and uh, protecting healthcare workers in terms of occupational health. Um, and so the, there's um, both kind of in the field the operational research that's going on right now, collecting data from Italy, Spain, um, working with colleagues in the US, as well as some of the R&D work on therapeutics and vaccines. Great, thank you. Anagret, I wonder if you can touch on, um, on, on group therapy. There was a question from the audience about virtual group therapy right now in the time of, of COVID. Any thoughts on that or where, where we can point people for resources for that? Uh, group therapy is great. Um, it, it, you know, of course, it brings people together. It gives is another chance for people to you know, just feel themselves in mindfulness, but also get help and stories from others who are in the same ship, so to say, in the same boat. Um, so we had that at that clinic as well. And um, I think that would be a wonderful resource to offer. If, um, you know, this really goes to the mental health professionals out there who are, I'm not a mental health professional. I'm just telling my story, as I said, but I think that's really an important resource to offer online, yes. Excellent. Well, for, for whomever asked that question, we'll do some research here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and we'll find some options and post them on our website. Um, so we have another question from the from the audience, and, and I'll open this up to either Ed or Anna Gret, whoever, whichever one of you thinks that you might have some input here. But there was a question about patients who are in the hospital right now. As you mentioned, Anna Gret, they're in isolation because they don't have families there at their bedside. What are the options that hospitals can do right now to help the patients that feel isolated and depressed? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go or do you want to? <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Dana Gret. Okay, so I am, um, there, there's been um, innovations, I would say, that I think are really great for this situation, and that is um, bringing in joy and happiness into that area. And uh, I've seen more and more people getting into healthcare with um, comedy, with magic tricks. Um, magic tricks, I think, are a wonderful thing right now that, any, you know, there's little things that, you know, like the trick with the light. I saw this one video with the, and, and, um, 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 with the sick child, how the nurse was just having this light on a, their hand and just playing with them and the light was gone and there again, and this child just cheered up. And I think magic does a way of just blowing the brain clear. What we do with mindfulness is nothing but that. When you do a magic trick, look at the people, like for a few seconds, they just don't have anything in their brain. So going in there and, you know, here in Germany, we have that too, the Humor for Healing um, Foundation, and they teach staff, healthcare staff, to bring in humor. They just put clown noses on their face. So I think we need to just be playful again and bring that joy and happiness to the front line of care. Because when I was, when I was in isolation, it is, 
um, horrible to be alone, to not know if you ever see your family again. I didn't think I would come out of there alive. I, I, you know, every time my body reenacted a stroke, it's just reenacting this. I, I didn't see I would ever, I would ever see my children again. I didn't have a person to talk to at the stroke and the people were so busy. And now also, you know, there's this uncertainty, this fear about this virus, the hectic environment, people, there's just so much civil resources. So just having people go in there and, and give that as a gift, um, I think that's what we need to be doing. And we can, you know, just bring that smile on people's faces will, will be really, really valuable right now. Wonderful. Yeah, these are all the really good points I read. I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, the attention right now in so many um, hospitals, but then also even in um, primary care settings where people are, you know, showing up. And when you have so much, in many uh, countries, you have so much community transmission and a lot of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic, as, as they're referred to also, um, uh, for patients who haven't yet become uh, symptomatic, um, it's difficult to know. Anyway, so all healthcare settings are potential places where people can, can get it, just like being out in the community is. So I think you then have, there, there does need to be a focus. You know, the first, our patient safety work is about um, first do no harm. So we have to uh, emphasize, you know, take steps to, to decrease the possibility of spreading from patient to patient, certainly, and also patient to healthcare worker. But there are some practical things I think that hospitals can do to um, consider how they do that and still also satisfy needs of patients. We tend to, in hospital management, think of groups of patients in terms of wards and group preferences and group needs. And I think you have to switch to uh, a little bit more towards um, individual needs and preferences. Pardon me for the background noise. Um, and uh, that the, um, you know, looking at uh, kind of setting up individual rooms uh, the way they might be needed, uh, using kind of disposable materials a little bit more during this time period, which is not uh, great for your green hospital movement, but, but um, that's a, a possibility. Um, that uh, also, you know, sort of making some provisions for, like Anna was saying, for uh, things that, that people will need to do when they're spending a lot of time on their own, reading, watching movie, listening to music, and thinking of some ways that you can uh, make that available in, in patients' homes and in uh, the patient rooms. I think also people um, uh, are looking at uh, effective ways of um, managing the, the post-acute phase uh, so that you minimize in a safe way the, the sort of time that people spend as they're coming out of the, if they had to be ventilated, uh, intubated and ventilated, if they had to be, um, uh, if they had to be on oxygen, et cetera. So, and doing that in other spaces that might that might give them a bit more light, sun, um, ability to uh, to move around. So the, the, just some a few practical things, and we might be able to put together some links. WHO has not published so much on this, and I think it's uh, it's giving me an idea for a new piece that the organization should come up with. So thanks for the question, whoever. Great. Uh, question, Ed, for you um, regarding uh, statistics in Mexico. Do you have any uh, specific uh, data to share with that group who's on the call? Ed? Can you hear me, Sorry, Ed? Sorry, I put myself back on mute. Oh, that's Sorry okay. That. <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, um, it's like the... The thing, by the way, um, one of the things I'm sure we're going to realize um, uh, when we get back into the office is that um, this terrible thing of uh, being able to take ourselves off video and put ourselves on mute um, has created a lot of bad uh, behaviors in terms of um, interaction with colleagues. Uh, so anyway, just it's a, it's not a, maybe that is a mental health issue too that we need to come back to. But anyway. Um, yeah, for um, the, we definitely on the website, um, WHO puts out a uh, situation report uh, every day that tracks numbers from uh, countries. Um, uh, and so we track all the numbers from across uh, the Pan American region. Right now, if you were to look at it, uh, Mexico is, has, um, this is as a data reported of last night, um, had, uh, has only 2,700, anyway, that we used to think that was a lot. 
uh, cases, uh, 340 about in the last, 345 in the last uh, 24 hours and 140 deaths. So it's, it's quite low. I mean, compared to the US, uh, as we showed you, had uh, 395,000 cases and 31,000 in the last 24 hours. So um, very different. It's about 10 down the list. Um, but uh, in terms of, um, you know, it's uh, case fatality rate and, you know, how the, it looks, we can certainly share that afterwards if people uh, are of interest. But the curve, if you look at, it's um, quite similar to the, to the U.S., but um, a much higher case fatality rate than, than the U.S. And I think that reflects, anyway, it reflects a lot of things, but um, reflects uh, probably mostly health system capacity and, and ability to access uh, intensive care units. Um, but at the, I don't have any more data on, you know, where, where is that happening in Mexico City or where it is, but um, I think that, that that's of interest. Okay. Well, thank you. And, and we do have your uh, situation report page linked on our website at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. So we'll be sure to send that out in, we'll, I'll add that to this PowerPoint before we send this out to everybody. So thank you. Um, another question, Ed, that maybe you can help with, somebody asked is, uh, do we have um, resources, any, anything that the World Health Organization may be, be able to provide in terms of guidance for um, staff with a really large stress load right now? Are, are there any resources that you're aware of that we can send folks to? And I assume that's sort of the, um, the physical stress and mental uh, stress. You know, WHO has put out, um, has, does have some guidance for uh, sort of uh, both um, and along with our regional office, have some guidance on for decision makers about how to repurpose and refocus uh, sort of the services in order to get ready for this type of surge. We've got a couple of tools out that um, help uh, kind of local and even national decision makers plan for the supplies they're going to need as well as the workforce they're going to need. And I think those are tools that are about just having the right um, number of people and what are you going to need for any given number of cases. And then, uh, then looking at task shifting, and that's a big push right now. Um, you, know, you do need to have the right respiratory uh, um, capacity at, in your hospital teams, but you can shift a lot of tasks that are traditionally handled uh, in one way by intensive care unit teams and critical care teams, emergency staff. And so we've got some tools on that um, as well. And um, uh, then uh, in terms of the, in terms of looking at how to handle the sort of overall work, we have a working group right now on occupational, as mentioning earlier, occupational health and, and health worker protection that, that um, uh, with a guide on some of those issues and some resources. So afterwards, I'll, I'll send the link over um, and uh, to you can put it up uh, on the, uh, the foundation's website. Wonderful, wonderful. And I'll, I'll also embed that also into the PowerPoint before I send it out so people can have easy access to it. That would be fabulous. Thank you. Um, another question. Um, any updates on wearing masks in public? There's a lot of discussion about that right now. And yeah, that's, that was like the big topic this week. Um, yes. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, the, I mean, basically, the bottom line is, you know, people live all over the world uh, in different settings and, you know, um, a crowded slum in uh, West Africa, or Latin America, or even in the outskirts of, you know, some of the big, big cities in Europe or wherever, um, you know, you're going to have much more crowded situations than you were in others. Your ability to physically isolate is, uh, more difficult in some places than others. Certainly, I worked for many years in West Africa, and most of the people I was working with, they lived in, um, uh, you know, uh, big families of 14, 15 were living in a few rooms. Uh, and so anyway, it's a, there are complicated situations that WHO has to put out guidance for everybody on. But from an infection prevention standpoint, and also there are you know, as uh, Dr. Fauci has said, there are people's, some people's job is to provide hope and, you know, get people engaged and get them to thinking, here's something I can do maybe to help protect myself. And then there are the people whose job it is to talk about science and facts and data. So WHO is in the, is, our VG sometimes is about providing hope, but mostly we are a science and fact-based organization. And it's, the fact is that 
the evidence from COVID, which is not that much, we, it hasn't been around that long, but then also from years of work on, on related respiratory illnesses like SARS uh, and other pneumonia-like illness, um, does not show that there is any evidence of benefit for a healthy person in the community wearing a mask. It is helpful when a sick person uh, um, who has symptoms, who's coughing, can wear a mask so that they don't infect uh, other people. It obviously is very useful for healthcare workers who are in a high um, uh, infectious environment setting to be able to protect themselves. Um, uh, but for, um, for the, uh, the average person wearing a mask, the evidence just isn't there. There is even some evidence, we've looked at, about cloth masks that, um, you know, if you don't take care of them in the right way and, and clean them and wear them right, that, um, that it's even in some cases perhaps can put you a little bit at greater risk. And also people tend to think that, okay, now I've got this on, it's a magic bullet, I'm, I'm protected, when actually it is much more likely than rather than you breathing in something that you're going to touch it on your hands and then later when you come home, put it on. So I've seen many times, I've had friends, even uh, video calls with them in the States and they've just gone to the store and uh, they've come back in and immediately said, oh, Ed, you're on the phone. Hey, hey, how you doing? Hey, let me get this mask off. And then you're thinking, no, 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 you should have washed your hands first. Well, you, like, who cares about wearing the mask out in the community? And so anyway, um, you know, your average person isn't trained on donning and doffing uh, personal protective equipment. So all of that to say that WHO has provided all of that, but fully recognizes that some uh, counties, some states, some governments have asked their their people to, to wear masks um, and uh, you know you should be in compliance with your local authorities but uh, the evidence uh, isn't there. And, and to follow up on that we have a question then about cloth masks. Um, is there, what is the proper way to use cloth, cloth masks? How often do we need to wash them and when are they protective and when are they not? Yeah, I will send, um, you know, this is like a super interesting uh, piece that we literally just um, put out this guidance on, um, on masks. I'm going to copy and paste it right in uh, to the chat here because um, it's like, it's, uh, it's, anyway, it's very topical. But basically, um, you know, the big push is that medical masks, uh, surgical masks, and then, of course, N95 masks that are a little bit cuffed and have, um, are for more protective for aerosols. Um, should be reserved for, uh, prioritized for, for healthcare workers. Um, there's a big push on making masks, all manner of supplies, tests, masks, et cetera, more available globally. The 25th of March, the UN Secretary General uh, asked for the full platform of the UN's supply chain, which is the World Food Program, UNICEF, big multi, multi-billion dollar operations to be fully put at WHO's disposal and to fully focus on, on getting um, the supply chain rolling again on masks, on PPE, et cetera. So that's you know, multiple uh, large uh, 747s flying around the world delivering already uh, these things. Um, already it's become more, uh, partially because of that, but also the US has been able to procure more uh, masks. So um, uh, that's another uh, piece that's, that's out there. Um, the, uh, so, the guidance on masks does talk about uh, the use of masks, and we just put out um, a piece on uh, uh, on that's called you would term rational use of um, uh, personal protective equipment. So when in certain situations you need to reuse uh, masks and that kind of thing. So um, the that also would be I think quite uh, quite useful for people. So. You know, in some cases when you need um, to use uh, like non-medical masks, meaning cloth masks, then our guidance just says that, you know, obviously the type of fabric and tissue, um, how breathable it is, uh, you know, the shape and the, the fit of the mask are, are important uh, to use. So there, we did mention some of the data that's out there um, that uh, cloth masks in a healthcare facility is not um, the greatest use cotton cloth masks. Um, not appropriate for use by healthcare workers, but uh, can be appropriate, uh, you know, uh, for use in, in the community. With the the idea being that anyway, the evidence um, 
is uh, is not there in terms of you know having a, a big impact on on what it is. But the bottom line is whatever mask you use, you should um, you know be careful in terms of placing it. Don't, don't touch it while you're wearing it. Um, uh, we have videos on our website that show people how to take on and put on put on and take uh, take off masks uh, correctly, et cetera. Great. Well, we we do have that link on our website as well, so we will share that today in the in the PowerPoint too. Um, there was a question about um, about patients who are recovering in isolation, and we did address this a little bit last week when we talked about the restriction of visitation and how that has impacted our patient advocacy at the bedside. And so, another resource that you'll find on our website is a plan of care form that families can use at home so that when they have conversations virtually with the care team, they can keep track of what's happening with their, their loved ones in the hospital. So that's an additional resource for everyone. But Anagret, I wonder if you have anything to add about particularly caring for patients in isolation and, and how we can help them. Well, as I mentioned before, you know, I, I was pointing at and um, looking at creative ways of getting in touch with them and bringing life back to them as something that's joyful outside of that despair. Um, but yeah, it's, it's tough. So I think that, yeah, using digital communication channels as much as we can to, to bond and um, really, as I said, you know, guidelines are helpful, but I think we need to go back to just, um, we, we keep talking about communication as, you know, we need to convey information and we need to, provide resources and lots of information goes through those communication channels. And sometimes we misunderstand communication as just sending information and instead of just sharing and understanding with each other. So I think if we can maybe just at the people that we're talking through, be it via the phone or, or through internet resources, or even if we get to see them face to face, it's just to ask ourselves that question, do I understand them? And how can we find a shared understanding with each other? And that'll bring us to a different level of communication, back to a much more uh, genuine and authentic meaning, sense-making between us that no guideline could ever achieve. Um, because communication is more than information sharing. It's about finding a shared understanding. And I think if we keep that in our minds and our hearts as something that guides us through this time, that's the best guideline we can follow. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think we have time for just one very last question. Um, Ed, the question is about um, our supply chain. Obviously, as you just mentioned, you were talking about masks. We have, we've had quite an issue with our, our supply chain throughout this endeavor. Um, what, what do you see highlighted, highlighted there about systems and training and supply chain that maybe might be new? Um, yeah, I think... Uh, it's a really, um, like all these many, and Greg was highlighting how many of these um, uh, things that some of us working in sort of in patient safety and in human factors and others that, that we have thought of for years of, as being um, uh, really important factors in how sort of healthcare is delivered now are all of a sudden put under a, a really white hot intense spotlight um, and you know sort of how the organization of service uh, really matters in terms of keeping people safe how you know infection prevention control is you know Florence Nightingale should have taught us this way back when but we've forgotten it somehow um, in the age of antibiotics and um, that and then the whole idea you know the importance of health workers and their health and whatever we were talking about earlier um, I think this aspect of uh, supplies and supply chain in the global economy, I mean, not to reflect on um, all of that, but, um, you know, the, the U.S. used to be one of the biggest producers of uh, medical masks in the world, and, and over the past not even 10 years, um, it's all gone overseas. Most of it went uh, to China, and, you know, I think we will really reflect on our interconnected global economy um, and this kind of uh, fact in an event like this of how of global solidarity that it's not just a matter no longer of well, geez I can't get my um, you know avocados from Mexico because there's this uh, trade war I'll just uh, you know I'll get them from Senegal you know when you have this type of breakdown and without 
a thought in advance of, of the different supply chains, you're never going to fix a, a, a problem like this when you're in a, when you're in a crisis. It has to be planned out beforehand. And so I think there'll be a lot of reassessing of global supply and supply chain management, um, and uh, in particular for these types of critical uh, supplies that are there. My big worry that's coming right now, um, I think, is that uh, you have massive competition um, bet between countries. It's like, as I had my uh, um, supply manager say, it's a little bit like the Wild West out there. Even the UN, in placing big orders on things, is getting a, there's big competition from other countries. And if you don't watch it, all of a sudden, uh, that order disappears and it's gone to another buyer. Um, and so uh, there needs to be more of a, the global solidarity we've seen uh, around other issues really come on this whole supply chain issue, I think, too. But I guess, anyway, just to say that, that there is good news and that um, the supplies in China and other countries have really started to ramp up again and, and deliveries being made around, around the world. I think for us at WHO, we're really worried that um, the uh, eating up of all those supplies by the Northern Hemisphere is going to mean that there's going to be very little left over for countries that are in, who are already well behind the curve in terms of bed supplies and PPE. Yeah. Well, I, I think we are at our time. We don't have time for any more questions, but I really want to thank both of you, Ed and Anagret. Thank you so much for being here today. This has been very interesting and, and informational. So um, for everyone else on the phone and on the web, thank you all for joining and we will see you next week. Have a great day, everybody. And thank you again to Ed and Anna Gret.